Okay, so I'm here with uh, Professor Chris Terry. Chris is at the University of Minnesota, and uh, we're here for uh, the very first Media Law Chat that I'm recording. I'm pretty excited about that. And we're going to be talking about a very famous case. Chris, what's our case? Reno v. ACLU. Yeah, so Reno versus the American Civil Liberties Union, um, very big in uh, when anytime we're talking about digital law um, in media context. So we're going to get going. I know that uh, everybody has done all of the readings that they need um, to understand this case, including reading the case itself and doing their brief, like good media law students do, right, Chris? Everybody briefs a case. Always. My always. Students are always doing all the Always. Readings. They never go to OEA. They always brief the case themselves. <laughs> All right, so I, I'm curious, Chris, I know you've done a lot of uh, research into the Reno case. Um, what's some background that people might not know? What are two interesting things about this case that, that get overlooked sometimes? Well, the case is about the Communications Decency Act. And one thing that doesn't get talked about with the Communications Decency Act is it was a devil's bargain. Uh, Senator James Exum from Nebraska was very interested in giving the federal government the ability to regulate indecent and pornographic content on the web to the FCC, much in the way that they do for broadcasting. Mm -hmm. And um, to do that, he had to had to strong arm some people. Now, this Communications Decency Act is part of the Telecommunications Act. Was it an add on to that bill? In 96, right? But, what's that? 96? Where is the era we're talking about? The yep. Telecommunications Act in 96. Most of the legwork happened in 1995. But Exxon himself, to strong-arm people to get them to include this provision into the bill, he carried around a blue folder full of pornography <laughs> that he had printed off from the internet, or actually had somebody else print off from the internet because he didn't actually have a computer or an internet connection in his office at the time. And he carried this thing around on the floor of the Senate. There's multiple photos of him. There's even a C-SPAN video of him talking about the Communications Decency Act, where the folder, the binder, is actually sitting on the table when he's talking. Huh. So this, what this was, was it was uh, those like plastic sheets that you can put a piece of paper in. Yep. Someone had taken an image from a website, and a 1996 website, printed them off on a dot matrix printer, the kind that had the little things on the side that you pulled off. And he had a page of these. There were 14 pages in this thing. Some of them were from places like penthouse.com or whatever. And he walked around on the floor of the Senate and he would show it to anybody who would look at it. <laughs> well, did he have a lot and of I've takers? Actually held the binder, I've actually held the binder in my hand. The binder full of porn? Archives out in Lincoln, Nebraska. <laughs> um, so he uses this binder as a way to get people on board with this idea. And fundamentally what he was trying to do was extend indecency regulation, the kind the FCC applies to broadcasters, to internet content. He's unsuccessful in doing that at first. But then Time Magazine writes a very famous article where they cite a really bad study from Georgetown Law, the cover of which is cyber porn. There's a little kid whose eyes are like this big on it. And they, they suggest that in 1997, or 1995, excuse me, 84% of all of the internet content was pornographic in some way or another. 84%? 84% of all internet content. In 19, now we're talking about 1995, right? You know, AOL, dial-up, Prodigy, CompuServe, all that. Uh, that this study suggests that that much of the internet is already porn. It's a preposterous study. There's no way... They ever did the analysis that they suggested. It's a sampling study that they extended the results on beyond, beyond any reasonable point of view. Anyway, the combination of the Communications uh, Act, the Telecommunications Act needing some votes, and a, uh, Exxon's efforts, he teams up with Senator Dan Coates from Indiana. They get the provision added to the Telecommunications Act as part of a larger provision to get the bill passed, the Telecommunications Act passed. And it works, and it works. And what the Communications Decency Act did was it applied internet-based uh, indecency regulations. But they weren't written in the same way that the indecency regulations for broadcasters were written. They were really broad. They covered things that wouldn't have been covered by traditional indecency regulation. Nudity, for example, even showing a nude image to a student or even one of my kids, like a 
um, even if it wasn't sexual in nature, could potentially have brought people under uh, a provision of the law. So it was way too broad. The act is challenged almost immediately. And you asked me the funny story. I'm, I'm getting to the funny story. <laughs> when the case goes to court in Philadelphia, the judges that initially hear the case have to have computers brought into their office so that they can see how much pornography there is online <laughs> as part of their analysis of the case. Well, that's so a really, talking about a that's time a really hard, yeah. Judges didn't have good enough, well, had, had enough experience with the internet to know if porn was actually a problem. So they brought three computers in to the district court and they let judges look at porn online in their chambers as part of the analysis. Um, quickly, an injunction against the rule is passed, is handed down. Case goes to the appeals court, same story goes up to the Supreme Court. And the issue is whether or not the court will uphold the decency rules as it had done in Pacifica mm -hmm. years before. For broadcast. For broadcast, yeah. Yep. So, so I think it's hard for people to remember this kind of a time where, where we didn't know, we just didn't know how to conceptualize this new medium. This thing was in everybody's homes. Was it analogous to a TV broadcast or was it analogous to a newspaper? What, what, what was this going to mean for us? I think it's, I think it's hard for people to, to get into that mindset and think about what that world was like back then. Well, it was, uh, that, but that's the important part of the story. When the court looks at this case, they look at the internet and they try to make a determination. Part of what happens in Pacifica is they say broadcasting is very, it just comes into the home, it's sort of nonstop, you don't have a control over it. Mm -hmm. But when the court looks, and the Supreme Court looks at Reno, and they look at this case, and they're looking at the internet, they're like, well, it looks a lot like a newspaper to us. It's a lot of text, there's some images, but not, I mean, there's no video, there's very little audio because the technology wasn't there yet. Mm -hmm. And they say, we think it's a newspaper. We really think that what the internet looks like to us is a newspaper. And it happens that perhaps the most important reason that the case comes out the way that it does is that it is 19, there is no internet streaming. There certainly wasn't the kind of pornography one can find with a simple search today. It, it was lots of text. Mm -hmm. I and mean, it was lots of text and the court looks at it and they say, well, it's not, it looks like broadcasting, but what it really reminds us of is a newspaper. Mm -hmm. Newspapers have been treated under strict scrutiny for things like prior restraint. It's not broadcasting. It's not got the scarcity element that causes broadcasting to be mm -hmm. treated differently. Also it's required some... We're going to treat it as a newspaper. And at the time required some technological sophistication. You know, you couldn't access things as easily as just opening up or turning on your television. Well, the court kind of relies on the idea that it come out of some of the cable cases that it was a choice to access certain content on the internet. Whereas broadcasting, you turn it on and it's there. Mm -hmm. And that's how they make that determination. But it, it's notable if you go back and read the decision and especially some of the, the concurring opinions, they're looking at this idea that one can find pornography and they're like, nobody's going to stumble on this stuff. You've actually got to go look for it where today that, I mean, that case would be an entirely different set of facts would, would come up. Yeah. I'm, I'm interested, has, I'm interested in what you think about that and what, what you think about, you know, in today's environment with today's court, would there be any difference in how this is decided? And with today's it's technology, hard, I should say. It's hard to guess that the technology, if you had the same court with the same technology, so if you had the 1997 court and you had the technology we had, the decision would be different. There's no question about that. If you had this court with this technology, the current court and this current technology, it's hard to know. You have some pretty conservative people on this court, not many of which have been in favor of sexual content over time. Mm -hmm. They've certainly protected violent content, but not sexual content. But this court kind of likes the First Amendment a lot. They tend to sort of err on the side of the First Amendment, almost to a fault in some cases. Um, so it would be easy to see how they would think that this was overbroad. Not that they would necessarily reject the idea 
the government could re- regulate this content online. I think they would declare much of it to be obscene. As in, in mm-hmm. that. But that they would be reluctant to give the government sort of an overriding power. Whatever other faults there are the Roberts Court, they really don't like large government infringement of the First Amendment. Mm-hmm. So why why do you think the CDA didn't use more of a Miller standard kind of approach? Why was it written so loosely? I mean, it's the the breath is is breathtaking. Well, the difference, of course, is the difference between indecency and obscenity. Mm-hmm. Axon wanted a consistent set of rules that would have applied across multiple forms of media. So he relied heavily on the indecency rules. And if you know anything about indecency enforcement in the United States, it's been so inconsistent over time mm-hmm. that it, you know, it ebbs and flows depending on the conservative level of the courts and the, the presidential administration at any given time. You know, it kind of comes and goes, you know, where people are debating the Super Bowl again here. That's <laughs> ironic. <laughs> that is. Um, it's an article in the, Trib- t- the Chicago Tribune today about the 1,300 complaints about this year's Super Bowl. I know. So first first we had uh, Janet Jackson and Justin Timberlake, and then and then Adam Levine without his shirt on, and, and now Shakira and J-Lo. It's that, the indecency of the Super Bowl. with a turkey sandwich, I've always said, and uh, <laughs> that's always the case. But that's, that's exactly what happened. When Exxon was trying to put this together uh, with Dan Coates, they, they actually, I have some memos of his that I pulled from the archive. They did talk about obscenity in some of those discussions, but they wanted it to be broader than that. They wanted it to deal away with profanity and things that wouldn't have met the indecency uh, guidelines in 1996, which mm-hmm. were basically the seven dirty words at the time. Mm-hmm. They were looking for something a little broader than that that would, would deal with the sexually related content that they were offended by. Exeter was a Democrat, but he didn't like flag burning either. He, he was a chief proponent of the flag burning amendment hmm. created at that time too. Interesting. That's an interesting aspect. So the, not the 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 uh, whole of the CDA didn't fall, um, wasn't struck down. What survived and why is that important? Well, the most important section that survives is section 230. Mm-hmm. And while it does only 26 words, <laughs> that's all it is. The internet would not look like it does today. Social media would not exist as it does today without Section 230. So the court said that Section 230, which was a provision added to the CDA itself to get the CDA added, uh, protects platforms for content that is posted by a third party. So if I go on Facebook and say really nasty things about my dear friend Katie here uh, (laughs) that are untrue or defamatory, uh, potentially libelous. Katie cannot sue Facebook. Professor Culver cannot sue Facebook for that. She can sue me, but Facebook is protected for the content that I post mm-hmm. there. It's third party immunity. That provision has created the internet that we know and it, it really is the defining characteristic of the contemporary internet. And it's a rule that protects an awful lot of speech online. Mm-hmm. There have been many attempts to get rid of that rule, or at least modify it in some way. Only one has been successful, and that is the SESTA and FOSTA legislation that was passed last year. And that took the first chunk out of 230's blanket immunity that existed by making it uh, unprotected speech to have advertising or information related to sex workers or sex trafficking mm-hmm. that in any way could have facilitated either one of those processes. Um, they were going after Backpage.com, a notorious right. website that had lots of uh, ads for consensual sex workers, but also non-consensual sex workers as well. And in the process, they they implemented a rule that took a just a razor blade thin slice out of 230's immunity. But in the process, they have eliminated untold amounts of speech online people who were afraid that they would no longer have third-party immunity for the content that was being posted on their websites. People took down websites by the groves. Mm -hmm. That is currently under challenge uh, in a case that is in the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals. Um, The Woodhull Foundation has brought suit against FOSTA. They had been initially denied standing to bring that case, but earlier this year, actually it was late last year, the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals um, 
gave them standing to bring the case. So mm. there is a pending First Amendment challenge to FOSTA. Will be an interesting test to see how 230 stands up because 230, this really, really important, really, really important provision is uh, now 24 years old. Right. And hasn't and I- ever come under any change. But there's been movements in Congress to change it, and there's been movements, uh, certain political movements, to change 230 as well. Yeah, I don't honestly, Chris, remember a time quite like the one that we're in now, where there's just pretty open discussion about taking on 230 and trying to substantially revise it. Um, you know, it's just never been an open question before. I mean, yes, within the sex trafficking space, that's certainly something that that has happened, and you saw that with Sesta and Fosta, but but you know pretty open <laughs> discussions now um about trying to get rid of that and and again imagining a world where there is platform liability is a pretty stunning game to me like that's a pretty uh, to think about well, what I would think... not be happening anymore is is you're right we wouldn't be where we are right now without that protection but it's also interesting thinking about about where we could be if some of that protection changes we would lose an untold amount of speech online. Platforms would not look anything like they do, and social media platforms would be so heavily regulated as to be basically unusable if 230 goes away. Part of the movement to get 230 to go away are the lawyers who can't sue platforms for the content that appears. So going back to our Facebook example, if you sued me for permission, I have five kids, you would not get 120 out of that equation. (laughs) However, if you were to bring a successful suit against Facebook, Facebook does have deep pockets, and mm-hmm. there's a lot of people who would like to go after that. But you have a weird coalition of people who are promoting that kind of action. Yeah. And that's where the, the dynamic has really changed in the last maybe 20 months or so, in that you have the sex trafficking people ganging up with the revenge porn people, ganging up with a lot of people who would like to control a lot more political speech online. And they all see 230 as the enemy. Well, but it's not just it's not just getting up with people who would profit. I mean, certainly part of that coalition is um, people who are damaged by hate speech, people who have been defamed. Um, you know, it's it's there are people who have reasonable claims that 230, that 230 immunity um, allows this, you know, sort of festering of noxious speech. Right. I mean, I get what you're saying that if it go, if it goes away, we lose untold valuable speech. But I, I do listen to people who say, but, but we'll also lose incredibly horrible speech, which, it, which is a problem. It's a thorny issue. And I, and I like to be really careful. I'm not, I'm not in the camp of people who are often adversely affected by that kind of speech. So, um, you know, I, I'm not an absolutist when it comes to much, but I'm not an absolutist when it comes to arguments about 230 because there, there are... It, there are effects here. There are people who are damaged by communication. I'm in the uh, in the camp that 230 stays until you come up with a better solution. Yeah. There, there's an awful lot of people out there who just want 230 to go away, and you will never, speech we're talking about, ever convince me that that's a good idea. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. I am just not going to buy that. There, yeah. You cannot sell me on that. <laughs> And you couldn't have sold me on it. I'm not trying to. But... You can absolutely not sell me on it after Cecil Plus. Yeah. But I've always been, if it's broken, fix it. Right? Mm-hmm. 230 is an option. It's, it's not, you know, it can be fixed if we want to fix it. I have not seen in any of, any of the proposals uh, that are out there, and I pay attention to this stuff pretty closely, mm-hmm. any that is viable in a way that would actually either work, be constitutional, or protect as much speech as 230 protects. Mm-hmm. I don't like hate speech, but I'd rather have hate speech and have 230 in place than the alternative, which is there won't be any speech. And that's quickly what will happen if 230 goes away. Um, I tend to be, I don't tend to be much of an extremist. I'm a regulatory guy, for Christ's sake. <laughs> uh, but uh, when it comes to 230, you, you're you going to have to come, come up with something pretty nasty to convince me to switch otherwise. Because the functionally how much speech 230 protects and probably the most important outcome of Reno VA so you is the fact that 230 was left on the books to protect speech all right okay well this was awesome ACLU versus Reno um, or Reno versus ACLU <laughs> yeah. 
Um, so thank you so much. I really appreciate you being our, our guest for our fir- for our very first chat. And um, no I look forward to posting this and having my students and maybe your students watch it. <laughs>